Today, we have with us our esteemed speaker, Lance Stott. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Plants, Soil and Climate at Utah State University. He has uh, extensive expertise in teaching landscape plants materials and his personal upbringing in the intermountain west. Uh, he has a lot of knowledge on uh, drought tolerant plants within our climate and also uh, knowledge about the native, native plants, shrubs, trees, annuals, and all kinds of different plants. So um, it wouldn't be uh, um, too much to say he's a, a complete plant expert uh, for mm -hmm. our, our climate here. And Lance, I mean, I'm being honest, that is what I know about you. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think without further ado, I would let, uh, I would hand it over to you, Lance, and you can, I will mute myself. I will turn off my video and I will let you focus on your presentation. If if there is any glitch or any problem, I will join back in or I will turn on and, and help with that. But it should flow smoothly. And I would like to thank again for all our participants uh, for joining in. So yeah, it's your lens. Okay. Well, let me just share this to get started. Oops, I'm not at the beginning. <laughs> um, thanks for that introduction. I, I think I am... Um, I'm pretty good with plants in the Intermountain West, but, um, you know, I could definitely brush up on some of the plants that you might have seen in, in Massachusetts, and I would definitely be clueless about a lot of the plants in, in southern Iran. So um, anyway, um, I'm really excited to be able to be here on this webinar with you guys today. Um, I, I do a lot of um, in-classroom teaching, so this is a little bit different than than what I normally do, but um, I love plants and I'm excited to talk about them. So um, I'm gonna get started because it's, I don't know, if you have this disease like I do, it's so hard to just pick a few plants that you wanna talk about. And so I probably have more plants than we can get through easily. So we may kinda, you know, steam through this. So hold on tight, okay? Um, so the other, other thing I want to say before I get started is this definitely is not an exhaustive list of water-wise plants, but it's some that I'm familiar with that I know do well um, in Utah. And lots of the ones that I have looked at are native to Utah. Um, there's some that aren't, but they seem to do well here too. Um, and then I'll try to talk a little bit about, you know, their kind of water use situation as we go through. So, all right. So a couple of things that are interesting about Utah, and these conditions might apply where, wherever else you might be, but Utah has an average elevation of 6,100 feet above sea level. Um, so it's really high altitude, um, has really low humidity, and the combination of those two things makes for like really, really intense sunlight. And so when you consult plant references that tend to be kind of more national or global in nature, sometimes they will mention that something is adapted to full sun. And sometimes that isn't true in Utah um, because of our intense sunlight. We also have really low summer precipitation. So the Salt Lake City average um, for, you know, basically recorded history for the months of July and August is about a half an inch. So that's not, not much. Um, so we have these cold winters, these hot summers, and then to throw a couple other things in there, we have these calcareous soils that have a pH usually around eight, which is, is not the typical recommended range for plants. So we sort of have these unique conditions for plants to be able to survive um, in Utah and in a lot of the Intermountain West as well. Many plants will thrive in Utah um, as long as there's enough irrigation water. And so historically, we've kind of relied on irrigation in Utah to be able to grow pretty much whatever we wanted to grow for the most part. But several things kind of come together and make it so that irrigation is becoming more and more limited, then we have to definitely look at different things to do. Um, so we can't necessarily do things the way that we've done them in the past and still get away with that because our population is increasing and we have this persistent drought that we've been dealing with. Though this morning I looked out and there's still snow on the Wellsville Mountains um, mid-July, which is good, but we need that to happen 
a few years in a row probably to reverse the the last 10 or 12 years. So um, we're kind of dealing with that situation. So how I've organized this is um, I just kind of started off with some herbaceous perennials and I'll kind of move into shrubs and trees. And I kind of left out annuals, not because there aren't annuals that could be used, but because um, generally when they talk about designing water wise landscape, they kind of limit that kind of annual kind of oasis zone. And so I kind of have glazed over that. So let's get started. So the first group of plants that I would definitely recommend for people in Utah is penstemon. And there's several different species of penstemon and they don't like to be overwatered at all. And I teach the greenhouse management on class, uh, greenhouse management class on campus and it's difficult for us to grow them in the greenhouse because it's so easy to overwater them in a peat moss based potting soil. So we're working on using different media to be able to do that. So here is a penstemon that's growing in a xeriscaped area on our campus um, here at Utah State. And it does have a drip system there available to it, but most of the penstemon species, especially the ones that are native to the West, will be able to survive most years without much irrigation at all. Um, other thing about penstemon that is great is there's lots of different colors, lots of different habits. And um, as I said, if you look for species that are native to Utah or um, species that are adapted more to the Western part of the United States, then they tend to do really well. Ornamental sages can be really fun. So um, there are Artemisia species, which is the same um, genus as big sagebrush and, and um, fringe sagebrush. These ones tend to be a little bit smaller, kind of group more kind of towards the herbaceous, but a lot of them have some really great texture. So this one right here in the picture is called Powis Castle. And um, they do get little yellow flowers on them, but most people tend to just grow them for the foliage itself. So they're really fragrant like a sage and they have this real nice lacy foliage and they, they will survive with um, a very little additional irrigation um, in Utah. So other ones you might look at, there's one called Silver Mound that's fairly similar. And then there's a species called Artemisia absinthum or absinthium, sorry. And that one um, does well here as, as well. Blanket flower is native to Utah. And the things I love about um, blanket flower is it has this really nice kind of furry, silvery green foliage. Some cultivars are a little bit more green and some are more towards a kind of a silver or gray green. Um, they have daisy-like flowers in all of the hot colors. So you can get anywhere in the yellow, oranges, reds, and combinations of those. And they tend to be free flowering all summer, do well in the heat, require very little irrigation, and even tend to be a little bit self-sowing. Um, in some cases, maybe a little too self-sowing, um, but really easy to grow and can be, can be kind of um, something that you don't necessarily have to do um, much irrigation with. So I have a part in um, of my landscape where I try not to irrigate much at all, and I'm growing these there. The next one that I want to talk about is called the desert four o'clock, four o'clock, or sometimes they call it the Colorado four o'clock. Um, and if you're familiar with four o'clocks, um, they're commonly grown as a container plant, but their flowers close up when the sun goes down or when the sun goes behind a cloud. And this perennial is that way as well, but it makes an amazing ground cover, kind of these dull grayish green leaves and they spread, you know, eight to 10 feet um, across the ground. And it's native to Utah and does really, really well on the xeriscape areas on campus. And I've also seen it in quite a few other areas. Um, I took this picture on kind of a cloudy day, so you can see quite a few of the flowers are a little bit closed up, but tends to bloom um, pretty much from, you know, midsummer to frost as soon as it gets warm enough. We'll survive with um, pretty much no added irrigation. 
the Sun Dancer Daisy, or or we like to call it the Soul Dancer Daisy on campus. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, these guys are really fun. They have these bright yellow flowers that are about between the size of a quarter and a 50 cent piece that kind of float up above the tufts of green foliage. And it's native to Utah. And there's a, a breeding program at the USU Botanical Center in Kaysville. And they call it this, this line of plants, Sego Supreme. So if you want to look at those, you can check those out. But their introduction um, for this plant is called Soul Dancer. Um, but these plants require very little extra um, irrigation, if any. And you get these kind of bright yellow flowers that kind of dance in the wind up above the foliage. I also love hummingbird fuchsia um, or epilobium. Sometimes people list this as Zauschneria. Um, but they kind of done more research into it and, and it actually probably really is an epilobium. Um, these are awesome. So they're, they have these orange into red tubular flowers um, and they're kind of this mounded green foliage. It makes it like a good ground cover or border or kind of mass plant. And they attract pollinators like crazy. So you see lots of pollinators visiting these plants. The Sego Supreme introduction here is called Wasatch Fire. Um, but a great plant that will survive with hardly any um, irrigation um, in Utah. Pussytoes is another one that's a native to Utah. Um, there's several different species of Antonaria, and they have these little white flowers in the early summer, and they resemble kittens' toes. And so that's kind of where it got that um, name. So here is kind of what they look like in bloom. This is a picture in the fall. So you can see the spent blossoms kind of up above, but you can see it kind of forms just this mat of low growing silver foliage. Um, makes a really great ground cover, grows without any um, additional irrigation. Gara is another one. Now, Gara isn't um, native to Utah, but it is adapted well here. And so, um, let me go back to this site. So in the bed right next to this um, pussy toes, there are several Gara plants here on campus. They have these butterfly-shaped flowers in either white or pink. Um, and it tends to flower all summer long. A couple cultivars that you might look at considering, one's called Whirling Butterflies. Um, and the other one that I have um, is called, it's in the Belize series, but it's a dark pink color. Um, and I'm really liking that one in my landscape. It's really, I just planted it this spring and it's, it's already taken off and, and is blooming like crazy. Um, so you may consider those a real kind of airy, beautiful plant. Blue flax is native across most of the Intermountain West, um, and it has a real upright habit with lots of blooms, and lots of times people will use this as a cut flower. It tends to be self-sowing, so you get plants maybe growing here and there. Um, tends to have a really long bloom period, so usually this plant is still blooming in October in Logan. Um, when I take my, my students around to look at um, herbaceous plants, so... Um, a great perennial that's that's easy care, low water um, for Utah, e pretty easy to grow from seed as well. This is one that I've become familiar with in the last um, several years. And, and I went on a trip to New Mexico for a conference um, the end of June, and this was growing um, out in the, the state park that I went and visited. So it's called chocolate flower. And it forms these kind of masses or drifts of, of plants that kind of free flower all summer long and they smell like chocolate. So it depends on the exact time of day and kind of have to pinch it, but it, it does smell like chocolate. And if you look at the bracts of the plants, which are kind of right behind the flower petals, they look like a lyre. And so that's where it gets its name, Berlandiera lirata. Um, a really fun, you know, xeric plant that requires no additional irrigation generally to grow here. Hyssop or anise hyssop, agastache or agastache, I'm told both are correct, um, is a great one as well. So 
Um, there's several different species, but the foliage of these smells like a combination of black licorice or anise and mint. Um, so a fragrant plant. The other thing I love about this one is it's adaptable to part shade. And sometimes it's really tricky to find plants that, that will grow in the shade, but also tolerate drought. Um, so has tubular flowers and shades of pinks and purples, depending on, on which species or cultivar you find. Um, found throughout the campus here at Utah State, grows very well in low water situations. Perennial salvias are also a really good water wise plant. They're not quite xeric, but they will tolerate pretty low levels of irrigation. So generally flower colors from white through the lavenders, violet blue, they're on square stems because they're in the mint family and they kind of have a minty sagey smell if you crush the leaves, really coarsely haired leaves. Um, they attract butterflies and other pollinators and they generally have a pretty long bloom season. And if you cut the flowers back after the initial bloom, they usually will come back and bloom another time. So this picture here is in the fall on our campus. And these have been cut back and are, are coming to bloom again. So another one that, that's really, really easy to grow, uh, maybe not quite xeric, but definitely a low water use plant. There are tons of species of sedums that you could look at. So all sedums kind of have succulent leaves, but there's a ton of variety in the size, the shape, the color of the foliage, and then also in the colors of the flowers. So you can get pinks and reds, but also um, flowers that are in the yellow. You get all sorts of texture. Um, sedums are pretty commonly used um, in green roof systems or things like that. So grow very, very well here. Um, a very low maintenance, easy to grow um, plant once you get it started. Um, one thing I want to mention, so this plant right here is sedum spurium, so it's a smaller kind of creeping type, but the upright sedums like the autumn joy sedum or similar ones to that are also really drought tolerant with really big succulent leaves. Um, I, there's a, a couple of new introductions have really intense kind of almost black looking foliage um, that intensifies more in the sun. Um, so can get a lot of different variety in the sedums. Ornamental grasses can usually be a really good addition to a low water landscape. So um, little blue stem is a native grass to the United States. Um, I forgot to double check if it's native in Utah, but it does well here. It's a warm season grass, so it doesn't get started until the weather gets um, pretty warm. So we had a really cool spring in um, Cache Valley this year, and it only got warm really in the last two weeks, probably. And so mine is just, just kind of about eight or 10 inches tall right now. But they get these eyelash looking um, seed heads throughout the canopy. And in the fall, they turn either red or blue, depending on which cultivar. So the ones that I have turn a really intense kind of blue purple color in the fall. Um, so love these, um, a low water plant that can give you some, some good massing or kind of different textures that you need in your beds. Blue Grama is another one that's native to Utah and most of the Intermountain West. It's a warm season grass, but it tends to grow a little bit sooner than the others and mature a little sooner. It has these really unique seed heads that kind of, um, they almost look like, I don't know, an insect leg or maybe a grasshopper leg. Um, really fun. And they tend to kind of go from a green to this really nice straw gold ball color. There's one called Blonde Ambition that people tend to, you know, really look for. Um, a great plant survives on our campus with no additional irrigation um, and across most of the inner mountain west that way. So blue grama is kind of on the short end. We kind of moved towards the other end, the tall um, grasses. Indian grass um, is a great one. It's a warm season grass. And um, it is native to kind of some of the southern parts of Utah um, in a little bit wetter areas down there. 
um, but grows with just, you know, a drip type low water situation here on campus. Um, when this, the panicles mature, the seed heads, they turn this kind of rusty bronze that kind of glows as the sunlight shines through it. Really beautiful um, plant that, that doesn't require much um, irrigation to be able to thrive. Switchgrasses are native um, to North America. Um, they tend to need just a little bit more water than, than some of the ornamental grasses, but they do really well in xeric areas or low water areas on campus. Another warm season grass, they're generally really tall upright, so kind of give you vertical um, lines. Uh-oh, my screen's blacking out here. There it goes. Um, so really tightly upright, and they have these really small um, seed heads that are very spread out through the panicle, so kind of gives you this like kind of airy, open look. And a lot of times the switchgrass will have real nice fall color as well, uh, depending on what the cultivar is. A lot of times they turn kind of a reddish color. So another one that um, survived with a little bit of extra water during the hottest part of the summer, but not much um, other than that. All right. The last um, ornamental grass that I wanna just touch on really quick is blue oat grass. And um, this is a cool season grass, so it's gonna bloom earlier in the summer. Um, one thing to note about it is it's, it's evergreen. So the, the Semper Byron's means always green. So this is one that you don't need to cut back every year. And it has these blue green leaves with really nice intense color. And then the panicles of the seeds kind of arch over and kind of turn this, you know, kind of tan brown color. It was a really nice texture, survived with very little extra irrigation in the landscape. So you kind of get a lot of different habits and colors just within ornamental grasses in the landscape. Oh, I kind of got one out of order. <laughs> well, that's okay. Creeping Phlox is another one that's a great one. So um, Creeping Phlox is native to North America. Um, it has this evergreen foliage that looks pretty soft, but actually kind of pretty wiry, almost, almost the texture of like pine needles. Um, but it has pink, blue, or purple flowers in the early spring, depending on um, which cultivar you pick. It works really, really well with um, basket of gold alyssum in a rock garden like this. So this is on, on campus at the old main building, if, you, if you're familiar with campus. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite combinations to see, um, but requires very little irrigation to be able to survive. All right, so that's kind of like the herbaceous plants that I that I picked that would be some examples of things to, to look out for. So if we move into like the woody plants, the trees and shrubs, um, first one I would talk about is called greenleaf manzanita, and it's native to Utah. And it has been in the landscape trade enough that they actually even have kind of selections of it where you can find, you know, different habits. Um, my favorite ones are ones that are kind of mounding. Um, and they make this really great ground cover or mass plant. Um, really broad green leathery leaves on red stems and requires no extra irrigation to be able to grow here. And an additional feature that I really love, and I thought I had a picture of these, but I couldn't find it. I showed it to my wife the other day and convinced her to plant it in our, in our um, front flower beds. So they have these bell-shaped white or light pink um, flowers in the late spring, um, which is really an added accent for this plant. So one I really love. Snowbrush is another one. Um, this one might be a little trickier to find in the landscape industry so far, um, but one that I think um, shows a lot of promise. So it's native to most of the Intermountain West. I actually took this picture in Montana when I was home at my parents' house for a family reunion, we went fishing in the mountains and I, I was, you know, wandered around and, oh, there it is, you know. Um, so it has really glossy leathery leaves with prominent veins and forms these kind of low spreading shrubs. And then in the kind of late spring, early summer, um, it has these white flowers that cover 
the bushes. This one's native to Utah. I found it while hiking around Logan as well. So another one that that I think is a great plant that maybe you know needs some more um, publicity. Um, this one is not a native, but I really love this plant and it does really well in dry or low water conditions. So sometimes they call it bluebeard or sometimes they call it blue mist spirea, but it's a caryopteris. And there's a cultivar called dark night that has like almost navy blue flowers. Um, but they have these irregularly lobed leaves, kind of like a, um, Japanese spirea. Um, but they're silvery and they emit this menthol kind of fragrance when they're crushed but they tend to bloom all summer long. Um, and the flowers come out, you know, at every note of the plant basically. And whenever we go and look at these plants in my classes, they're, they're completely covered with bees. Um, so they attract a lot of pollinators. Um, every so often they get a little bit, you know, leggy, a little bit out of control, uh, need to be kind of cut back to the ground, but they'll quickly um, regrow in the next season. So one that I really, really like. Service berries are another one, and there's several different species of these, and some of them are kind of more small trees and some are more shrub-like, but they have these round, dull, gray-green leaves. They have white flowers in the late springtime, and they generally get a really nice fall color. Some of the species just get a bright golden yellow, excuse me, and some of them um, get shades of orange and red that are really nice. Um, this plant really tolerates the high pH of the soils in the Intermountain West. Um, some of the species are native to Utah, several of them. Um, and I really love to find a service berry bush somewhere when I'm hiking in the summer when the fruit is ripe because um, it has these edible blueberry-like blueberry fruits that are so good. Um, and if you can find the, enough at one time, it's really nice to make a um, service berry milkshake. So, um, my students also like to find these in the fall when the um, berries have dried on the plants and they still taste pretty good when they're dry on the plant in, in the fall. So one that does really well, uh, anecdotally, if you overwater this plant, you will kill it. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> Glossy black chokeberry is another one that um, is kind of fun and I, I don't think it's commonly known, but has some really good um, qualities. So kind of a shorter, more mounding plant, has these really glossy green leaves that have little black stiff hairs right along the midrib and sometimes along the leaf margin. And it gets these white flowers in late spring, really good fall color, generally mixtures of yellows, oranges, and reds. And it has these persistent, almost black fruit. So melanocarpa means black skin or black fruit, basically. And, um, they're really astringent. So they are edible and some people call them a super fruit. Um, what I would say is it has a lot of pucker power and generally the birds kind of even almost avoid them till later on in the season. Um, but they're, the um, berries are actually ornamental even going into the winter. Choke cherry is another one that's native in most of the Intermountain West. Um, you kind of see two different things. You see the native choke cherry shrub, like I have a picture of here, really big kind of glossy green leaves that come to a real sharp elongated point. Um, they tend to be multi-stemmed or kind of spreading, um, not particularly aggressive, but they do spread and they have off-white, really fragrant flowers in the, in the late spring. And then the choke cherries are edible. Um, my mom used to make choke cherry syrup or choke cherry jelly all the time from the ones that we would pick um, there. These can grow in a little bit wetter situation, but they also tolerate pretty good drought with, with no trouble. Um, I love the bright gold fall color of the native choke cherry shrub, and it's just awesome. <clears throat> There are a couple tree forms that people will plant and they're pretty commonly used. They are drought tolerant. So Canada red or Schubert um, kind of have this red purple foliage. They can be really nice. Um, the tricky thing with them is they tend to sucker really heavily. And because they're pigmented so strongly towards the reds, they usually don't get much of a fall color. They usually just dry up and fall off. Um, so, you know, 
give and take in those, um, depending on what you're looking for, but both are, are really low water plants. Nine bark is another one. Um, native to the United States, I couldn't find much information on, on its um, distribution in Utah, but um, it has lobed leaves, kind of almost look like a maple leaf a little bit on these basal kind of arching shrubs. And so here's one on campus here in the fall. And this is actually kind of not really its fall color. So this is one that's actually got gold leaves during the summer. So you can get green, gold, or purple leaved options, and there's various sizes. They have white flowers kind of in the early summer, um, but a lot of people plant them purely for the foliage. So Diablo is one that is a large purple leaved, so it's going to be like up to 10 feet tall sometimes. Summer wine has purple leaves, but it's a dwarf one, so like three to four feet. Nugget is this one right here, which is that gold color, and it's a little bit kind of more compact growth. So it looks like it's really tall here, but it's actually on a kind of a mound of dirt near a fountain on campus. Just checking time here. <laughs> this is one of my all-time favorite plants right here. So the clove current or the golden current. So um, it has large three lobed leaves. So they usually have really distinct three lobes and they kind of tend to arch over and kind of spread, not spread from the roots, but the branches spread. And it's in the gooseberry family. So the fruits are um, edible and they have parts of the flower remnant um, coming out of the berry. Um, my students like to eat these when they're dry on the plant as well. But one of my favorite things about it is the golden flowers in the early summer smell like cloves, which is kind of an unusual fragrance for a flower, but I really love it. And the fall color is fantastic. So reds, oranges, purples, um, and they tend to hold on to their leaves for quite a while. So you get this um, fall color display for quite a while. Um, hardly any extra water required, um, grown in lots of xeric areas here on campus takes heat really well, you know, like on the west side of a building where the afternoon sun just kind of beats on it. So love these guys. Um, Ribes alpinum, the, the alpine current is also a good water-wise plant. Desert sweet or fern bush is uh, another one that's native to Utah. And this one grows definitely in xeric locations. So you'll find this one growing naturally. Um, in the drier parts of Utah. And it grows great in landscapes. So there's lots of this on campus. They have these fern-like leaves that are kind of sticky and they emit this sweet smell when they're crushed. And these kind of bright red stems gets off-white flowers in the summer, kind of sporadically blooming into fall. And then the seed heads hold on to the plants and, and kind of give some extra interest there. Um, a taller, bigger plant you know, sometimes 10 feet by 10 feet um, works really well to make kind of a massing type plant. It's semi evergreen. So depending on how hard the winter is, they may or may not lose their leaves. This is one of the most fun common names for a plant, rubber rabbit brush. Say that five times fast, right? So another native to Utah, um, the thing I love about this is when most of the landscape is kind of getting tired in the later part of summer, it's been hot, it's been dry, that's when these guys start to put on their show. So they flower um, generally later summer into fall, um, August into September up here in Logan. This kind of gray green foliage tends to make these really neat mounds that tend to be almost completely covered with those golden flowers when they bloom. Pollinators love them, so these will be totally covered um, with bees. Requires no extra water. New Mexico locust is one that is a really great plant. You have to be a little bit cautious about this one. I think it's, I think they say it's zone seven. So in Logan, we're, we're zone five. So, you know, it's kind of right on the edge there, but I know there are um, quite a few of these in the Salt Lake area you know, all along the Wasatch Front. But uh, a xeric plant um, that's native to kind of more of the southwestern United States, 
most of the time it's a multi stem shrub or, or small tree, kind of pink, purple, pea shaped flowers. Um, the branches do have thorns, um, like, you know, um, black locust or the native honey locust. Um, so you do have to watch out for that, but a really beautiful, um, small tree or, or shrub for a zero area. Again, just use a little bit of caution if you live more towards that, like zone five. Mountain mahoganies are awesome. So um, there are two different species that you might find and, and they're fairly similar. The leaf shape is a little bit different. And then there's a subspecies that's called the little leaf mountain mahogany. That's a little bit, the leaves are quite a bit smaller and the plant itself tends to be a little bit smaller. But all three um, species tend to have these, they have these tiny golden flowers. They're not like really showy. They're, they're only about, the diameter of a pencil, um, but there's lots of them usually, and they give way to these kind of curly tailed seeds, which are really just kind of fun to see. And the way these work is the wind will kind of twist this and drill the sharp pointed seed into the ground. Um, but they have these leathery semi evergreen leaves, this really beautiful, smooth silver bark. And native to Utah, I found some um, clear up at the top of the mountains up as you're going towards Bear Lake from Logan that were just huge and beautiful um, last summer. This picture here is just one that's here on campus, but um, definitely one that requires no extra irrigation to survive. American smoke tree is native to the United States and it, it does really well in Logan. It has these really big leaves that are have really prominent veins. So you can kind of see the light colored veining in the plant. And the thing I love about this is it gets this fantastic red, orange, and yellow fall color. Now, there is another species of smoke tree or smoke bush that generally people kind of discourage. And, and part of the reason for that is because it seeds so prolifically that it can be pretty invasive. But the seeds on the American smoke bush are usually pretty sparse. And so we don't see a lot of seedlings of this one popping up, but it has really amazing red, orange, and yellow fall color. Um, and a really, you know, kind of on the small side of a tree or, or a um, large multi-stem shrub, but fantastic fall color and a low water plant. In general, Birches tend to like more water, and so I wouldn't necessarily recommend a lot of birches be planted in a low water landscape. But there is one that I really love that's native to Utah and, and quite a few places around the Intermountain West. Um, and it's called the water birch, or sometimes I'm better off at sticking to Vegula occidentalis because it's easy to mix up water birch and river birch, which is a different plant. But it has this really smooth, shiny bark that resembles a flowering cherry. So really smooth, beautiful bark. Um, sometimes, you know, reddish, almost into black, almost always multi-stemmed and um, has these nearly round leaves that turn a really bright gold fall color. Um, and I really love this. I was, I was really sad because they redid the fountain on campus here. Um, the last couple of summers and there used to be a really beautiful one of these right in the center of the fountain and they they took it out but i did notice as they opened the fountain back up this spring that they planted one in that same spot so i'm excited for that um but of the birches this one is is pretty drought tolerant it, it isn't xeric but it definitely will survive with very little additional moisture Talk about a couple species of maple. So the Rocky Mountain maple, Acer glabrum, um, is kind of a, a large shrub, sometimes maybe a small tree. It has leaves with kind of rounded lobes. So they almost look like they don't, you know, almost look like an entire leaf. And it has really bright red twigs and silver gray, smooth, larger trunks. Gets really good orange or red fall color. And it is native to Utah. A low water plant, what I see happening with this one as summer wears on and it gets pretty dry is it usually just goes dormant early. Um, so it'll get its fall color a little bit earlier and it's a real nice orange or red and then it will go dormant, um, but does very well. 
and you'll find these growing around the mountains of Utah. Big Tooth Maple is another one that's native um, on the mountainsides in a lot of Utah, Idaho, um, in those areas. And they call it the Big Tooth Maple because the leaves have a really big central lobe. Um, it's related to the sugar maple. And so like the sugar maple, it gets really nice fall color. So it has a great mix of reds, yellows, oranges, purples. Um, so if you've driven in the canyons of Utah in the fall, um, you'll see a mixture of big tooth maple and, and gamble oak or scrub oak, and you get this really nice mix of colors. It has nice, smooth gray bark in some cases, eventually turning a little bit shaggy. Most of the time it's multi-stemmed or kind of shrub-like, but a great low water plant. <laughs> All right, whoa, running out of time here. The gamble oak or the scrub oak is a great native plant, has good fall color. It's often kind of thicket forming, kind of naturalistic, small lobed leaves on coarse twigs tends to put on a lot of acorns. So if you're interested in attracting wildlife, um, that tends to help with that. Um, definitely a good one that's low water. Burr oak is also in the same kind of group. So they group oaks into the white oak group and the red oak group and the white oak group tends to do really well in our climate. So burr oak has these really, really big leaves that often have this really big lobe at, this, at this, the end of the leaf really coarse twigs with this quirky, awesome bark. And the acorns usually are surrounded mostly by the cap that has this fringe of, of burr-like hairs. They also hybridize gamble oaks and burr oaks and they call them burr gamble oaks. So you may find those, all of these would be um, tolerant of our soils and um, low water use trees. Kentucky coffee tree is another one that's native to the United States. They're pretty ugly when they're young. <laughs> so when you buy one at the nursery, they generally kind of just look like a stick, but they're worth the wait, okay? And these ones are kind of just um, young trees, kind of adolescent trees, but eventually spread into a kind of a broad round can um, canopy, really highly textured branches and trunks. They have these really massive bipinnately compound leaves. So the, the leaves are actually kind of, a, you know, about two feet in each direction. Um, because of the texture of the branches and the trunks, it has really great winter interest, um, a drought tolerant plant that, that does well. Now, some of you may cringe when I mention possibly um, looking at growing a mulberry, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend digging up the mulberry um, weed that's growing wherever in the corner of your lawn. Um, but there are a few cultivar cultivars of mulberry um, that are fruitless. And so mulberries generally have been avoided because their fruit's messy. And when it gets spread all over, they tend to grow, you know, everywhere. Um, so I would definitely avoid, you know, like digging them up or planting one from a mulberry seed. But mulberry trees tend to be both drought and heat tolerant. So when I went to New Mexico um, two weeks ago, all around the city of Las Cruces, I found all these amazing mulberry trees. And so it's a picture of, you know, this, both of these are mulberry trees. Um, but they have these really large leaves that are varied in shape. And so on the tree, about no two leaves are exactly the same kind of fun. So what I would recommend is look for either the fruitless cultivar, which is kind of a standard sized tree, but it's a male clone that doesn't have fruit. Um, kind of tends to spread more broadly than tall. Um, but does well in the heat and the drought. Chaparral is a fruitless form um, that's grown pretty commonly in the industry, but also would be low water, um, really beautiful plant um, as well. American elms are great trees. And when Dutch elm disease came, it kind of wiped out a lot of them, but we still have a few really fantastic ones um, around the, the state. Um, this one here on our campus is amazing. I couldn't fit the whole thing in the picture. It's so big. It's about 150 feet tall, probably. Um, and so people had kind of avoided planting um, American elms for quite a while. But they're these really tall, basal shaped trees with these buttress trunks and these large, glossy green leaves. Really beautiful. Um, but what they did when Dutch elm disease started in about 
1930s is they started trying to figure out how to get resistant Dutch elm disease um, cultivars. And so there were two methods that they went about doing this. One was to go and get genetics from um, elms from Asia. And so those ones are kind of hybrids and they're not necessarily true American elms, but there are four cultivars of true American elms. So Valley Forge, Princeton, New Harmony, and Lewis and Clark um, that are Dutch elm disease resistant. The research is still showing that they are. Um, but American elm trees are really deep rooted and really long lived and are really just a beautiful tree. So one I would um, recommend. Some of you may also cringe here when I say reconsider junipers, but judiciously reconsider junipers. So I, I usually tell my students that one of the reasons that people kind of despise junipers is because junipers weren't grown correctly. So a lot of times you plant junipers and you let them grow and then pretty soon they're taken over your house. So you get your chainsaw out and then you end up with something that looks like a hat rack with a few needles on it. So with that caution in mind, um, there, there are a lot of cultivars of horizontal or creeping juniper that are great. And one is called Blue Rug, and that's this one right here. And so this is in a Zurich area on our campus. So there's yucca growing up here, which I didn't put in here, but is a great plant. Um, and you can see this Blue Rug juniper is kind of creeping down and crawling over these boulders. Awesome. One caution about um, horizontal junipers or creeping junipers, they're not steppables. So if you walk on them and snap the branches, everything from where you broke the branch on will die. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. There are also some upright forms of um, Rocky Mountain Juniper or Eastern Red Cedar that make really good formal lines. Um, so you can see these ones here. Um, no extra irrigation required for those as well. Bristlecone pines, there's a subspecies species of these native to Utah. It's not the typical one that you see in the landscape trade. It's more kind of like shrub-like and kind of tortuous. Um, dark green needles and fives, they have sap dots on them and kind of give this real um, formal bottle brush look. Really slow growing and really interesting forms, but grows on campus with no additional irrigation. Pinion pines are also native to Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. Um, they can either have one needle or two in the groups that, that kind of bend back towards the stem, kind of arch like an eyebrow. Really fragrant pines, slow growing, long lived. Um, you can harvest the, the seeds and they're sold as pine nuts and you can buy those. Um, fantastic um, habit shape, just naturally kind of form these real nice um, lines great plant to, to um, use in low water landscapes. All right, last one. Ponderosa pines are native to Utah um, and most of the inner mountain west. They tend to do really well on kind of drier sites. Um, they have really long needles in groups of three. They tend to be a little bit narrower and more upright than an Austrian pine. Austrian pine tends to kind of spread more and be a little more flat topped. Um, really large cones with sharp pointed scales. Um, I usually tell my students, if you were going to get in a pine cone fight, you'd want to be underneath a ponderosa pine if you were in, in, you know, northern Utah. There are some other pines that have, you know, spinier cones, but um, this plant can get pretty massive, end up being, you know, 100 plus feet tall. Um, generally not quite that big in landscapes, but one that is really drought tolerant. Okay. Whew. You guys sworn out yet? That was a long list, right, Lance? It is, and there's more. I, yes. I can't, like, you know. You can't fit everything here. I can't choose between all the plants. Sorry, my phone is going off. It's supposed to be quiet. Yeah. But... Yeah, Lance. That was, that was a really great presentation and really applied one. So, I mean, we could take the knowledge from here and directly apply it in our landscape. So that was really, really helpful. And now with this, um, I am moving on to Q&A. Okay, perfect. So the first question is, does blue old grass propagate on its own? 
So in my experience, I don't see it growing up as a seedling anywhere on campus. It tends to stay like a real tight bunch grass. You know, it doesn't, doesn't really even spread. Yes. Um, and I haven't noticed seedlings of it growing um, awesome. in, in, um, in Logan. So maybe you need to um, cut, cut it out or split it or divide it and then, and then take it to a different yeah. location. Yeah, usually uh, you would probably have to divide it to propagate it. Awesome. I think you could grow from seed, but, but it would be easy to Definitely. divide. But it's not one that aggressively s- spreads. So, and April asked, would the majority of these do well in Eastern Utah? And for these, I think we can look at the, when we buy plants, of course, we can look at the USDA hardiness zone, right lens, and, and select based on our location. For the most part, I think pretty much everything on here would survive in Eastern Utah. Uh, some of it would depend on irrigation status, right? So you would tend to want to be more on the Xeric side if you're if you're not able to put any irrigation um and you know some of them like the some of the like the indian grass and the switch grass need just a little bit more water um mm-hmm. i think hardiness wise other than maybe the new mexico locust i think pretty much everything would survive in eastern utah that's that's a, that's a good answer and uh, there is another question like how many years does it typically take to establish this plant before they are considered drought tolerant, how often do you water when you establish them so as not to overwater? And once established, how often do you water? It's it's a long question, but an important one, I guess. It is. It is. I'm glad somebody asked that. Um, it it and it's a great question because even some of these plants that are considered xeric don't you usually can't just plant them and forget yeah. them. Okay, so you you are going to have to add some water for the first few years. Um, usually what I would recommend is using a drip system and um, just watering them about once a week. Um, and it depends on the size that they are. You know, if you're planting from one gallon containers, you're not going to have to turn on your drip system for too long. You know, you you have, and drippers vary. So you might have like one that's one gallon per minute um, or sorry, one gallon per hour, one gallon per minute is pretty fast, one gallon per hour. So you might turn that on, you know, for an hour and give you, you know, kind of the equivalent of taking a gallon um, jar of water and pouring on. The idea is you want to make sure when they're young to make sure that their root system doesn't ever get completely dried out and kill the plant. Um, but you also don't want to keep it wet all the time. Um, so a lot of these just, they don't like to have what we call wet feet. And so they just need to dry out in between. And then as they get established after their first two or three years, a lot of them, you can basically kind of like phase out or even just like stop watering unless you have really extreme drought conditions where you might give them a little bit to kind of keep them looking a little better, even though they could survive without any. But in our landscapes, we usually kind of want to have you know, pretty healthy, nice looking plants. So we usually give them a little bit of help in the most extreme of drought if we can. Yeah. And, and when, when I even talk about watering on my talks, it's like, you need to understand, like the watering needs to be deep. We can go do infrequent, but it needs to be deep so that the root can go down below. If we just provide like a little bit of water frequently, then, then the root would grow on the top surface and then the plant wouldn't be healthy. And right. with a little way, it might topple down. It, it's not healthy. So when, right. and when we say establishment, it's usually one to two year uh, for a plant that is not like big, like you have a small plant, you can, it can be established in a, in a season. But then if you have bigger plants, it takes a while to get uh, it established. But then you could always tell by new growth. If you are getting a lot of new growths in the plant that ha- was very small in a container, then it's probably established. But then if you have a five gallon tree and you get a new growth, then that might be from the container. So uh, there is a this uh, balance between uh, the new growth and knowing how, how fast the plant are established. But to be on the safe side, like one to two years would be would be good. And right. Yeah. And as you, as the plant grows, you're going to water it deeper and deeper, right? Mm-hmm. So 
if you have a small container and you water it so the water penetrates down six feet, some of that's wasted water when it only has roots down about a foot. But as it gets deeper roots, you want to water it deeper, but still infrequently. Yes, that's right. So we move on to the next one. Are these plants readily available on market? Do you have nurseries that you recommended that provide these plants? Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to recommend specific nurseries for sure, but, but some of these are readily available. Um, so there's a nursery here in Cache Valley that kind of specializes in some of the natives. And so I was able to get the green leaf manzanita from them and they had several other native ones. Um, some of these plants you can find at just about any nursery. Um, but it's good to ask at the nurseries for things that you're looking for because demand is what creates that supply. And, and this is kind of a problem a little bit in the industry is if people are finding out about these water-wise plants, but in some cases they're having a hard time finding them. Um, so there are places to get them and there are more places um, that are are coming on board to, to supply these, especially as you know the drought persists and the population increases and, and the regulations around water are changing. We'll, we'll see more, but most of the ones that I showed are fairly readily available. The one I think you might have the hardest time finding is the snow brush. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's move on to the next question. Before that, uh, if you log out or if you are leaving the presentation, uh, you will be prompted to a short survey. It takes like a minute or so. Please feel free to uh, provide your input, which will determine what kind of speaker and topic we'll, we'll present in future. Now, Julie asks, can the cherry choke cherries um, mar side work from their uh, sidewalk from their fruit? So, yeah. Um, um, so... Choke cherries tend to have a pretty large pit and not a lot of fruit um, around it. So like any cherry or plum, they could stain a sidewalk. But I don't think it's going to be a lot because there just isn't a whole lot of flesh on those choke cherries. So it really is a kind of a thin layer of flesh around a pretty good sized pit. Okay. And then the next question is, is there a somewhere online that says what will do well in my specific county in Utah? I'm curious in case this want to do well in Eastern Utah. We already answered this question. And also you could go to the uh, Conservation Garden website and put in your plant type or desired plant type, and it will pop up with the plant list. So there are, yeah, there are online resources, which I send it to you, April. And yeah, so let's move yeah. on to I should have vetted this against, I know that Salt Lake County and Utah County have a list of these plants do well with Utah Lake irrigation water and these plants don't. And I, I didn't vet this against that. So you may want to consult that, but otherwise I think what Utah said is, is right. Yes. And Lance, where would you suggest we find this plant in nursery or mail order? What about seed? Uh, seed, I mean, you could do mail-in order or search different sites for seed, but for the plants, as we already discussed, it's in the nursery, right? There are some mail order nurseries where you can find some of these, these plants. And I found some of them. A lot of the nurseries though are starting to move into doing more of this. Um, but but again, ask, ask. Yes. Say, I'm looking for this. Yes. And, and sometimes nurseries can get things in that they, they don't normally carry, but they don't, Unless you create the demand, they, they may not. So, yes. Uh, Mosem asks larger leaves makes more transpiration. And in general, it is true, not always. Uh, the number of stomata in large trees, uh, in large leaf trees, are higher so that you have transpire more water. But then, even the smaller leaves may do faster transpiration. So uh, it always depends on the rate and all, but generally you are, you are right. Right, Lance? Do you have any? Yes, gen yeah, generally that is true. And, yes. you know, if you're looking at these, like the oaks and the um, the coffee tree, the mulberry, the, the elms, they're, they're not going to be as drought tolerant as like a sagebrush or a smaller tree. They, they just aren't. But as far as large trees, they tend to do pretty well. Um, and 
if you just think about the situation, if you go out in, you know, arid upland desert areas, you, you don't see trees. No. Usually you, you see, you know, more shrub like growth. And, and so, I mean, there is a little bit of that in there, um, but trees in the landscape are really valuable. So if you can find some big trees that, that do well with just some supplemental irrigation, then it's a good asset. Okay, and Lori asks, how large do water birds typically grow? It does it like fifty. Oh, yeah, um, water birds usually is is around twenty feet in each feet. direction, so it, it's kind of a smaller smaller plant. Um, yeah, definitely kind of on the smaller side. How tall can you get a gambel? Or can you prune them up if you don't want to tickle it with a street stripe and i think i gave a little bit of information to julie on that but yeah, yeah. what do you yes think? you you can train them to be more upright and there are actually some cultivars introduced that are kind of more designed to be a tree in general though they're still only going to be like a 20 to 25 foot tall yeah. tree <clears throat> And Glenn says, thanks for the Mendelia plant. So um, thank you, Glenn. Uh, Suzanne asks, we are requiring plants or trees to be water efficient and fire wise. Any great resource suggestion for your customers in Park City? Uh, so yeah, Suzanne asks, is there any resources uh, that uh, they can suggest to customers or growers in Park City for water wise and fire wise? Uh, that that yeah that doesn't always 100 percent coincide does it the water and fireways yeah um i i don't i'm not 100 percent familiar with what their firewise requirement or suggestion is for park city um you know some of these are going to be you know firewise plants mm -hmm. um but but i i don't know specifically what what they're looking for on on that so so maybe we have to look into that one a little bit more. There is an extension article I can like. Okay. Answer it here. Oh, sorry. Done. Uh, I will send it to Suzanne, or I'll put it in the chat, Suzanne, for everyone. So this is a firewise plant for Utah landscape. It might not be completely true, or you might need to tweak it for uh, Park City. But I think, yeah, as Len said. They might not always coincide, but yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's a judgmental call, I guess. And yeah, thanks for the nice uh, presentation. Can they talk to their fire station? Oh, I don't know if the fire station might have a list for local uh, firewise plants. Uh, it doesn't hurt to ask. And Susan says, thanks. Thank you, Susan. And we love having you in the presentation. With this, I don't see any more questions. Uh, as all the questions are answered and it's 303. So again, if you need CEUs, please email me uh, and I can provide you with a certificate of uh, attendee, attendance. Also, if you need a DOPO, uh, uh, let me know and I will send it to Mija and she will do that. She will do those. Uh, and if you don't have any other questions, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And please feel free to provide uh, pro uh, provide the survey response or the feedback. It's really helpful. Thanks, Lance. This was an awesome presentation. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah.